Uh, this speech is about UEFI, the Converged Firmware Infrastructure. So we have Dong Wei here. Dong Wei is a HP fellow. He's an IEEE senior member and he has exp extensive experience in leading the industry innovations. So Dong was actually the person who pushed the industry to event, invent the UEFI technology and extend the ACPI and ACPI technologies. Uh, Dong serves as the Vice President at the UEFI Forum, Inc., and Secretary of the ACPI SIG. I'll pass it on to Dong now to sport, talk about the UEFI. So the Thank you. I, what I have heard is that I'm the great, greatest uh, devil here. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think uh, um, if you have been here last time, last year, uh, at uh, LinuxCon uh, Australia, I wasn't here. Uh, but I got notified that um, a person named Matthew Garrett actually uh, <laughs> presented a very good session on uh, UEFI Secure Boot, and, and I'm going to touch on, on to that topic uh, later on in my session. And that created a lot of uh, discussions over the year. Um, <laughs> so uh, if, if you're deep into this topic, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I think we have two uh, good sessions today, uh, today and tomorrow. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, you know, the history of UEFI, uh, how it's related to the Secure Boot, and, and some of the confusions that are out there. And then tomorrow, uh, James is going to uh, talk about how Linux Foundation is dealing with some of the, the secure boot uh, aspects. So uh, look for tomorrow morning sessions as well. Um, so um, you know, before this topic of UEFI secure boot was brought up to, uh, to this conference, um, I don't think the UEFI term was very familiar uh, for a lot of people. You know, so traditionally on the x86 world, we have been uh, deeply involved in BIOS, right? So if, if you try to boot a system from, um, you know, a PC, uh, usually you use, uh, you know, you, you deal with the BIOS infrastructure. Um, certainly, you know, on the ARM side, you have a different uh, structure, you know, U-boot or whatever you, uh, have you, right? So something that bring the system up to a known state so that the operating system like Linux can uh, start to run. Um, so I want to talk about you know, why we get into this you know, situation of using UEFI rather than just keep continuing on with BIOS or, or U-Boot or what have you. Um, so it's a lot of the motivations behind that, and a lot of them are actually very applicable to today's environment. And then I, I think there are a lot of confusions about there, there are actually many different uh, technologies related to security. Security is always a very... Um, you know, fancy word for a lot of people, right? The minute you talk about security, you know, everybody jumps into it, right? So uh, there are actually several different technologies around uh, the topic of a secure, related to security uh, in the areas of boot. So I want to make sure that people have a very clear understanding on a couple of different uh, side of the story. Uh, so that when we talk on the, on the blog or, or, you know, out there, you know, we, we have a very clear distinction between some of the technologies. So quickly, the, uh, the motivations. So I was there in, uh, you know, when, when I began at HP, we, we started to develop the, the technology called Itanium. Uh, so this is used for a very large system, you know, in, in the business critical uh, systems, you know, in, in banks, in, in uh, you know, very high, you know, large infrastructure. Uh, that demands a lot of, uh, you know, mission critical businesses uh, that runs, you know, 99.999% of the time, right? So you can only have less than five minutes a year to, to have the system down. So when, when we look at that infrastructure at the time, uh, we, we were initially wanting to run Windows 95 on, on that machine, uh, which as you can see, it's, it's, it's not a good idea. <laughs> um, and Windows 95 at the time was based on BIOS, right? So we looked at the BIOS, and what we found was, well, Itanium, as you may know, uh, was created as a 64-bit uh, processor architecture, right? But you look at BIOS, it's 16-bit, well, 
it's pseudo 16-bit. It's not entirely 16-bit. When you look at the memory space, it's only one megabyte. And, and you, know, you can only address 640K because uh, somebody believed that's all the memory you need forever, <laughs> right? So, uh, and then you have a little bit of a space up there uh, just below one megabyte to execute the, the adding card option ROMs. And you know, the, the, the number you can fit in you know, at most are three. So you, know, you cannot boot from many devices if you, uh, if you keep using that <coughs> mechanism. At the time, we didn't know, but we had the vision that somehow the hard drives are going to go beyond 2.2 terabyte. And today, you know, we have three terabyte hard drives out there, right? But can you use that as a boot volume uh, if you use BIOS? No, because BIOS depends on MBR. And that format has a 32-bit address in there that you know, just points to this range that, that are below 2.2 terabytes. So, and then there are a lot of other things that are related to the PCAT architecture. A lot of the hard assumptions that you made you know, for that machine. Um, you know, I.O. ports, uh, you know, some of the architecture you don't have I.O. ports, right? And uh, VGA, you know, everything has to have a VGA. Why? You know, Linux is used in a lot of embedded spaces. Why would you have to have a VGA in that space, right? Um, you know, so um, PCI, uh, you know, there is a limit of 256 bus numbers. Well, in the old days, it might be okay, but the minute you hit PCI Express and you're trying to build a large system of hundreds of I.O. ports, I mean, I.O. slots, and then uh, you try to do hot plug of these I.O. devices, it runs, runs out of the number. And then everything has to route through this single controller called uh, uh, PIC, right? The, the, the interrupt controller. All the interrupt has to, uh, you know, goes through one device. That's not a very good way to build scalable devices. So, um, you know, because of all these problems, uh, we, we try to uh, create an architecture that basically, uh, you know, address these limitations by, you know, making the infrastructure more universal, extensible, and flexible. So now you, you know that the, the, the architecture is not limited to one processor architecture. And I, I'll get into that. And then you, 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 know, you certainly can use three terabytes for, you know, for your hard drives. And uh, uh, you, know, you don't have to have VGA. Uh, you know. Let's see. So a little bit of a history on, on how we uh, got to here. So like I mentioned, uh, in, in about mid-90s, we created this infrastructure. And then uh, around 2000, we figured, well, it's not good to just limit it to x86 again. I mean, uh, to Artinian again. So we, we expanded that to cover x86 as well, because we want to make sure whatever we create is not limited to one single generation or one family of processors. <coughs> Uh, so in 2004, we took the idea, you know, from, from you guys, you know, the, the free software, open source, right? So we created this open source uh, community that deals with uh, coming up with the implementation of this architecture. And this, this effort has been going on for, for, you know, until now, you know, it's, it's still go, going on. Um, so in 2005, you know, after AMD created the 64-bit the extension to the x86 architecture, we, we defined the processor binding, and everything else doesn't have to change. You know, you can su still support you know, PCI, USB, uh, you know, SATA, whatever have you, right? And then you just you know, define a little bit of the pieces related to that 64-bit extension. And the good part of that is you know, when we're looking at supporting ARM, well, it's easy because we just need to define a little bit of uh, the processor binding for ARM. And we initially, initially did it for 32-bit, and now we're working on 64-bit. Uh, and you know, the, the, the interesting thing is the 64-bit binding of UEFI is already done. And we cannot publish it because ARM has not published the 64-bit uh, architecture yet. So we're waiting for them. Um, so <clears throat> last year it was actually a pretty big year because you know I think many of you know that a lot of the PC systems you know at least on the client side you know had to do the, the UEFI implementations so we saw a very uh, large uh, adoption on, on that front and we have now have 230 plus members uh, in the UEFI forum which is a non-profit organization 
And uh, you know, we focused on boot performances, which is important in the, in the PC uh, you know, systems. And we certainly also worked on the security part, which I'll cover a little bit also. And uh, looking forward, you know, starting from uh, this year, we're, you know, we're not done. We, we still need to look at uh, you know, the ARM adoptions as well. And also we, we, we want to figure out, uh, you know, since we, we think it's a very good uh, converged infrastructure for firmware, we want to also move some, uh, some of the other system configuration related or management related capabilities into, into this infrastructure as well. So I, I'm not ready to announce anything new, but uh, I think you can look forward to some of the new things that are going to happen uh, this year. And here's a very uh, 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 you know, illustrative diagram of how things are going on the x86 front. So, so as you know, uh, the 64-bit implementation of the x86 are uh, widely adopted. I think there are only a few uh, exceptions for, for the SOCs and stuff, but most of them are 64-bit. So, so the, you know, this diagram shows, you know, between, you know, comparing between the, the legacy BIOS implementation and the UEFI implementations, uh, you know, the UEFI really took off uh, over the last few years. It, it was a long process. You know, it, it, it started uh, around 2005, and, and now we're kind of seven years into it, uh, which is a, a little bit surprising to me because uh, I came from, you know, like I said, from the Itinian world, where there was no install base, right? So to change is easy. But for x86, uh, you know, you, you don't realize how, how much, you know, the, the industry is so embedded into the, the infrastructure. You know, making such a change is a very big deal, actually. So, so that's why we, we, uh, we're seeing that uh, probably uh, at the end of the year, we, we will see 90% of the x86 systems uh, adopting UEFI. And, uh, and uh, you know, when, when you hear the term UEFI, you also have to uh, know a little bit of the differences among a few uh, classes of machines. Uh, the, the issue is that uh, as, as the industry adopts these machines, uh, they are progressing, progressively adopting it, right? So it's not overnight everybody, you know, goes from UEFI to, to I mean, goes from BIOS to UEFI. Uh, you have to, you know, take a very gradual uh, steps. So there, there were a time, you know, a couple of years ago, a lot of machines are using UEFI code base. You know, they're using the UEFI, uh, you know, implementations. But because the OSs are not ready, right? So they, or, or the adding cards are not ready. So, so they have to still present this thing called CSM, the compatibility support uh, module, to you know, still pretend the system is uh, BIOS so that the OSs can run on top of them. So, so now you have this, this issue where you're going out there buying machines and say, oh, I want to support my three terabyte machine. And you know somehow this machine is supposed to be UEFI, but it doesn't support my three terabyte machine. Why is that? Well, that's because that machine doesn't actually expose you with the UEFI boot interfaces. It was still the the BIOS interfaces that that the OS is seeing. So you know there's not a very good way other than to buy Windows 8 logo machines today to make sure that you got the right one. Because I, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, you know, there's not a lot of good documentation from the vendors uh, to make sure you buy the latest one. To, um, you know, th there's no effort by the vendors to retrofit. It's a very big effort, right? So if you already had a machine from two years ago and you say, "Oh, can you provide this new UEFI for me?" No, the answer is no. Nobody is going to retrofit that. You know, the past is gone, and, and we're looking forward. So uh, there are machines that are class three, which means that <coughs> there are no, uh, there's no CSM on that machine. So you have to, you know, everything has to be based on UEFI. Uh, there are a few of those machines around already. Uh, on the ARM side, um, you know, ARM incorporate, uh, incorporated itself, you know, the ARM proper is uh, also, you know, very interested in, in looking at supporting the industry uh, using the UEFI interfaces. They are a uh, contributor in the UEFI forum. And <clears throat> so they have been working with us uh, very deeply in um, you know, making sure all the tools and, and the architecture are ready. 
Um, so like I said, 32-bit binding is already there. 64-bit is defined, uh, waiting to be published. Uh, I don't know what, what, what version number we're going to be calling it, you know, maybe 2.4, but yeah, I'm not going to pre-announce pre that. <laughs> so, but, but you can guarantee it's going to be there uh, this year. And there's also a question from many of you out there that basically said, well, um, you know, we had some, you know, boot-related uh, open source activities going on, and UEFI, you know, doesn't seem to provide me with a complete open source model for me. And I like that uh, complete open source model. Um, that actually is not related to, you know, that has no relationship to the UEFI architecture at all. UEFI architecture itself doesn't preclude you from providing a pure uh, open source implementation. It doesn't demand you to do that either. Okay, so, but if you look at uh, the Tiano core uh, open source effort uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, just uh, uh, on the last page, um, you can find that you know, many of the implementations are actually completely uh, uh, open source. So, so those are two different uh, questions. You know, so the, the reason some of the you know, companies are, are not quite providing everything in uh, open source is, is uh, you know, ha having a lot to do with the, the IP models and everything. It doesn't have anything to do with UEFI. And uh, I don't know if you know the Lenaro effort, uh, which is the Linux on ARM. They have a nonprofit organization that does that work as well. And in that group, there's a thing called the LEG, uh, the Linux, uh, the Lenaro Enterprise Group. Okay, so so that's the group that uh, we have been working with to, uh, you know, looking at implementing the UEFI. Uh, you know, Grub and, you know, and, and all that kind of uh, uh, interfaces uh, for, for using the UEFI ARM binding. So they had some s sort of a roadmap uh, for, for this year. And this is actually public, so uh, you, you, can, you can search and, and find it. Okay, so Secure Boot. And that was the, the issue that uh, was brought up uh, from last year, right? So why, why did we look at the secure boot? So, uh, you know, if you remember when I talk about the creation of the UEFI uh, architecture, um, one of the reasons that we, we created that was to try to make the, the new infrastructure to be modular, extensible, flexible, right? But by doing that, you know, the interoperability has to happen when you, when you actually define the interfaces for both sides of the, the, the implementations, right? The consumers and the producers have to agree on the protocols. And uh, actually, uh, yesterday's uh, keynote was very interesting to me because you know, she was talking about a lot of the, you know, she saw the world in the protocols, right? And you know, the, the version numbers and, and stuff like that she mentioned, it applies to the UEFI uh, you know, definitions quite well, actually. We were struggling on that part as well. You know, do you define something as a new protocol or do you just you know, increase the number of the version? Um, so that, that's actually very, very uh, related. Um, so as you do the interface designs, uh, standardize it, well, you created a problem because previously each vendor is doing their own BIOS. So you have this, this security through obscurity, right? People, you know, they have to reverse engineer how you implement the thing. It takes a long time. It's not completely secure, but it takes time for people to crack your, your code. Right? But the minute you define everything in standard interfaces, well, it, it's up for uh, attacks, right? So the attack surfaces are larger, you know, the minute you try to define these things in, in the standard interfaces. So what do we do? We, we you know, the, the BIOS side, you know, the firmware BIOS area is very attractive to the attackers. You know, the minute they hack that area, you know, they don't care about you guys, right? I mean, you know, whatever gets loaded afterward, you know, they, they have complete control, right? So, so you know, whatever OSs or, or virtual uh, machines or, you know, hypervisors, they don't really care if, if they can attack the, the, the bottom side of the, the stack. 
So we, we saw it as a problem, and also you know it was widely reported there. There are a number of issues uh, already. So uh, Phoenix, which is a BIOS company, um, they initiated the discussion. They said, well, that doesn't uh, work very well. You know, you you have to create something to to uh, uh, to address the need. So there was a uh, what what we call the security sub team formed within the UEFI to address this topic, and. So the initial definition of it was defining 2.3 of the UEFI specification. And then Microsoft came in and said, well, we had some uh, new ideas as well. Uh, so they, they changed the, a, a little bit on how you do the, the variable authentication, you know, just, just a little bit of a, a differences. Uh, so so we, we kind of included that as well, you know, as you know, two different approaches. And then they said, oh, you know, we, we would like to contribute the authentic code specification for you to use. Well, we already had the PECOF format as, as the file format for UEFI before. And now they said, well, we also contribute authenticate, which kind of makes sense to us. So, so we said, okay. Um, so in Secure Boot, we basically have three components. Uh, the, the definition of what we call the authenticated variables, a way to uh, authenticate variables. And then we also ask uh, you know, what we call the driver signing. Well, actually, it's, it's a little bit beyond just signing the drivers. You know, all the binaries that are related to boot would need to be signed. So driver is only one aspect of it. And you also have your OS loaders and some of the other applications that, that might be needed. And then there are also the system-defined uh, variables that I, I will talk about a little bit. So this is an image that, that you are probably very familiar with, right? That's how you do the digital signing. So I'm not going to uh, dive deep into that. You know, so I think people are used to uh, this mechanism already. So, uh, like I mentioned already, you know, in 2.3, we had a, a counter-based authenticated variable definition, uh, which was originally uh, from uh, Phoenix. And then we have this time-based authenticated variable mechanism from Microsoft. Um, and so, so that's, that you can see why we have, you know, these different uh, differences in the protocols or the way to, uh, to define these variables. And we also had uh, the support for the append uh, Function, so the, all these are you know bettering the design of uh, of the uh, the authenticated variables. So not not a whole lot to that. You know, if you're a security expert, uh, you you would recognize these things are uh, needed. So like I already mentioned, the driver signing, right? The actually the application and driver signing, the binary image signing. So in Secure Boot uh, mechanism, uh, what you do is you, every time you load the next image, you make sure it, it is signed uh, and it is signed with the keys that you, you recognize. And if, it, you know, if the image is not something you recognize, uh, I mean the signature is not something you recognize, you, you don't load that image, otherwise you load. So uh, the, the, the things that usually gets, uh, get signed are the OS loaders, of course, and then also the, uh, uh, you know, the adding card uh, option runs. Um, let's see. So we, in that UEFI mechanism, we, we do not you know, deal with these, uh, you know, the, the legacy BIOS side. So, you know, the minute you use the CSM, you know, the compatibility module to, to load the, the legacy OS or, or use the legacy option ROMs, you know, we, we don't have a way to deal with, with that. So that, that's out of the scope. So this is just a, a, a picture of how you, you know, the process of how you sign the image and then how you actually verify the image. Uh, there's not a whole lot to it. It's not rocket science. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, number of keys. Uh, so the way we defined it is, is that we have a platform key which controls, allows you, you know, the owner of the platform key can update uh, the key exchange key. And then the owner of the key exchange key can uh, update the whitelist and the blacklist, basically. The DB is containing the, the signatures that you allow to uh, recognize and boot. 
and DBX is is basically the the blacklist. You know the things that are that are known to be bad. And then you also have the secure mode, uh, which basically uh, lets you know whether the the system is in the setup mode or not. Uh, I talk about a little bit on on that. You know so. You know, the way it works is that uh, you can actually have the system sealed to support the secure boot, and then you can somehow have a way to uh, break into the system and, and move it into what's called the setup mode. And then in that mode, you can actually change the keys, uh, you know, however you want to, and then you, uh, you know, you, you seal it again to, to move back to the secure boot. Uh, there, there, there's a little bit uh, of, of uh, maybe controversy or, or misunderstanding in that area I, I'll touch upon as well. Um, and so, uh, so what, what, how it works at the factory, you know, we, 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 you know HP produces uh, you know, the PCs as any other OEMs, right? So we, we collect the certificates from you know, everywhere, um, you know, OSVs and and, and partners, the, the trick is that you know each system doesn't you know it, 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 all these keys would have to be in the non-volatile storage, right? But the non-volatile storage is a very precious uh, resource, so we can't just say, oh, you know, we collect everybody's keys and we dump it there. We, we don't have that kind of resources. So the fewer the keys, the better. But that certainly created a, a little bit of a challenge as well. And then we. Uh, we load it into the system, and then we deliver it to the to the to the vendors. And uh, after the user gets the machine, uh, you know, if, if this machine is a general purpose machine, he can certainly go in there and uh, you know change the uh, the keys if they want to, right? And also the the OSs like you know Linux or any other OSs could have the ability to revoke. Uh, you know the keys in the DB and DBX because you may find out somebody else's uh, you know program is not supposed to be loaded and, and uh, you, you want to make sure to block them. Okay, so like I said, um, we we like fewer keys. Uh, you know, from the platform vendor perspective. Uh, because we, you know, all these things would have to be in the flash. So, uh, you know, the UEFI forum actually went out there and, and looked for a, a signing service. And it's very tough uh, out there. We realized that, you know, the liability is really high. And, you know, f you know UEFI forum is simply a non-profit organization. And, and the membership fees are really cheap. Uh, we should have charged a lot of money, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's cost prohibitive for us to, to stand up a, a signing service. Um, so we, we would like to work with the industry to, to, you know, to make sure that you know, people can sign the images. And uh, Microsoft certainly provided a, a UEFI signing service. And I think for a lot of the uh, the IHV uh, devices, uh, that really makes a lot of sense to get them uh, signed through, through that venue. And it's actually pretty cheap. It's $99 for, uh, sign, you know, to register that service and then, you know, all the signings are free. So that's not a very big financial burden for, for the IHVs. Um, and but they also you know there's a little bit of an update on their uh, signing policies and, and we actually you know HP uh, recently ran into a, an, an issue that you know uh, when when we try to sign these images right and uh, we, we had some some programs that, that we want to sign but but then uh, you know there there are a lot of issues with you know the, because of the liability is high. And, and there are a lot of issues like, you know, whether the program is of production quality, you know, uh, whether the program itself is going to be launching some, uh, you know, other applications and, and that launching mechanism, whether it's, it's secure or not. Uh, so there are a lot of questions on, on that area. I'm, I'm not certain that everything is, is uh, settled down in that area yet. Okay, then there's a lot of confusions out there. Uh, I think you know when 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 
people are implementing UEFI Secure Boot, uh, you know, because of some of the requirements uh, coming from the OS vendors. Uh, that became a, a kind of a success story uh, to extent to some extent. Uh, then, then you know, there are other related uh, secure security related feature set that then people kind of get confused. You know, which one is which? In, in TCG, the Trusted Computing uh, Group, there is also a feature called the Measured Boot, but it's also been called the Trusted Boot. And so, so now you have Trusted Boot, uh, Secure Boot, and then uh, Microsoft has another term called Secure The Boot. And so, I, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I don't know if, if you guys are confused. I'm, I'm certainly confused, right? So, a lot of the discussions out there that basically, uh, you know, centered around these uh, discussions, and, and there was somebody who was saying, oh, UEFI Secure Boot now requires TPM. Well, no. You, you can certainly use TPM to implement uh, UEFI Secure Boot, but UEFI Secure Boot doesn't require a TPM. And I can show you why. So, I, I don't know, how, uh, do you know TPM? Uh, do I need to get into TPM? Uh, yeah, I, it's just a hardware device that get, uh, give you the capability of storing hashes and stuff. So the TCG Trusted Boot, you know, you, you have this uh, stack on the right and, and this TPM device, and I, I can just show you the differences. Okay, so in this Trusted Boot, what you have is anytime you load the next binary, you measure, you store into TPM, and then if it's okay, you transfer control, and then you measure the next one. You, you, you store the result into the TPM again, and then you, you load the next one. Okay, so, so this is how TPM, you know, the trusted boot or measured boot works. UEFI Secure Boot is not that way. Um, so, so we simply validate the signature for the next image, and then we transfer control. Okay, so th there is a difference. That's why you see the UEFI Secure Boot does not depend on the TPM. But I said just minutes ago, you, you can actually use TPM to implement your EFI Secure Boot. So is that confusing? No. Why I said that, you know, the, the keys, right? You know, the, the, the keys I mentioned, the PKs, you know, the platform keys, the key exchange keys, the DB, DBX entries, those keys, if you want, you can measure them and you can store the measurement into the TPM. Or you can even store the keys into the TPM, right? TPM is just a, a, a fresh kind of a device with some uh, you know, random number generation capabilities and stuff. So, you know, so I, I hope that you know, through this discussion, everybody is clear of the differences between the two technologies. They can be complementary, but they are not dependent on each other. And uh, the other reason I, I have this, uh, you know, the solid lines below and the uh, dashed lines above is UEFI Secure Boot only addresses the solid line uh, loading. It doesn't address things up there. So that's James' <laughs> task. We, we wash our hands clean. <laughs> Okay, so because we're, we're just doing the booting, right? We're not into how you guys load the kernel modules and, and stuff like that. Okay, so this is just uh, what I said about, uh, you know, that no interdependencies between the two technologies, but you can complement them, you can use the TPM for both purposes, you know, it, it, it's that. And uh, beyond the UEFI Secure Boot, there's another element uh, that I don't know if you have heard or not. Because e even if you put the Secure Boot, uh, it's not secure. Because anybody can f flash the chip clean with his image if the flash utility is not secure, right? So you actually have to have a, a, a secure way of doing firmware update. And you know, UEFI uh, spec actually didn't define, you know, much about how, how to do that, but, you know, it certainly provided some uh, interfaces like the update capsule that you could use, but vendors doesn't have to implement that. 
you know, you can have your proprietary ways of doing the, you know, controlling your pro, uh, the firmware update. So the, there is a, uh, in, in the U.S., there is this organization called NIST. Uh, it's, it's a U.S. government-related uh, organization that defines some BIOS protection guidelines. And in that guideline, uh, there are elements of how you uh, protect the firmware update mechanisms. So to have a complete story, you, you have to have that as well. And I think the, the number is called 800-147. You know, if you search NIST 800-147, uh, 800-147 is actually a collection of several documents, but there is one, one of them is related to BIOS protection. And in, in this reference to BIOS, it's actually a, a generic term. So, you know, it's not in the contrast between the legacy BIOS and the UEFI, it's just the you know, the firmware that, that loads the, the image. Yeah, because a lot of the x86 people are familiar with BIOS, so we now, you know, you, you can even run into somebody saying, oh, UEFI BIOS, right? Well, what we mean is it's using the UEFI te technology to implement the firmware that boots the operating system. Okay, that's a little bit uh, <laughs> interesting. Oh, uh, because HP pays me for this trip, so uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it, it makes sense for me to, to show this diagram to you. But that's not the point. My point here is actually showing you that UEFI technology is not just about PCs. So, um, so we have used it in, uh, in the embedded system a lot. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you use our enterprise uh, laser jet, for example, uh, it's actually using uh, UEFI. And the very interesting story about that is, uh, is that uh, there was a period of time when we have uh, moved from generations to generations of the, the laser jet machines. And you know, the firmware guys are not in control of the destiny, right? So you know, HP is a hardware company, so hardware people are controlling the roadmap. So, one day you're told that uh, you know you're supposed to do the MIPS uh, um, machine, and the next day it's PowerPC, and the other you know the, the next day it's uh, Xeon or whatever you know x86, and now it's ARM. So you know a lot of the features that they develop into the, the printers, uh, if if they had to like redo all the designs themselves every generation, it's never going to be time to market. So, so what UEFI provided them uh, was the ability, because I mentioned, uh, you know, it is processor ag agnostic, right? So what they have to do is all the features that they developed, it's just a recompile and move, you know, that moves from one processor family <coughs> to the next. And so now the firmware guys are happy because they are like, well, you know, screw you, you know, hardware guys, whatever you, you want to do, I, I don't care, right? You know, you create another processor family for me, well, fine. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we can just recompile and, and, and uh, implement that. So, uh, and, and the same is true for some of the storage devices and the net, networking gears. Yeah, because they, fundamentally, these devices are computers, right? They are using some sort of uh, processes. And if you dig deep, they are remarkably similar to a PC system, you know, today. So, yeah, there's no, no magic about that. Uh, you can use the technology uh, everywhere. And the, the best thing about this embedded side is you don't care about, uh, you know, the operating system requirement, right? A lot of the, the times the, the, the operating system there are, you know, proprietary or, or you know, very specially designed. So, well, certainly, uh, PC is the area that, uh, uh, that implements uh, uh, UEFI uh, with the Windows 8 logo I mentioned. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to support the, the three terabyte hard drives, make sure you get, uh, uh, you know, these, these newer machines. And uh, you can certainly still support the, these, you know, the, the interesting thing about the, the hard drive is that if you format it into MBR, then you are limited to uh, this two, ter two terabyte uh, boundary. But if you uh, format it into the GPT, the, the grid partition table format, you know, some OSs can actually recognize those uh, drives as data drives, but they just couldn't do it with the, the boot, boot volume. So if you, you want to use the boot volume, uh, you know, those hard drives, 
then you, you have to have those kind of uh, BIOS, you know, the UEFI BIOS support. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I sit on the board of the UEFI forum and I got a lot of questions from, you know, everywhere, right? So people are asking, well, I have this three terabyte drive and, and I tried to install Windows 7 or something and, and all I saw was 700 gigabyte. That's actually very interesting. Think about it, right? It's not that you can still use two terabytes and you waste the one terabyte. You're actually wasting 2.3 terabyte and try to use that uh, 700 gigabyte. Uh, the, the reason is just because all these, you know, how Windows formats your drive and, and somehow the, the partitions are not laid out uh, quite, quite uh, capable of supporting all the drive volumes you, you want. And then on the server side, certainly, like I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the IT system has never uh, supported the BIOS boot. So it's class three from the very beginning. And the x86 servers uh, we're working on, some of, the, uh, some of the servers will be class three. And then even some, uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the tablet formatted uh, PCs are, uh, are class three as well. Because you know, for some of the tablets, because they are, you don't have to you know, support adding cards or, or you know, maybe they are not even supporting some additional OS is it's a very specially built device. Then you know you you actually don't have to uh, you know support the the old version of the BIOS. Um, so CSM is not required on those machines. Okay, so uh, summary. So before you get out the door today, I, you know these are the points I want you to remember. Uh, if you can remember them, then I think I. Uh, I'm successful. Otherwise, I guess I need to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> so, first thing is uh, UEFI is a platform independent. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's ARM or x86 or MIPS or, uh, you know, or whatever have you. Uh, and UEFI Forum is a not-for-profit. Uh, we, we kind of, you know, if, if you actually set into that uh, working groups in, in that forum, you can actually sense that a lot of people are bending backwards to accommodate people. You know, we're actually a, a very good organization so far. Hopefully that, uh, <laughs> that continues. Uh, usually it's very hard. You know, industry standard bodies, because the vendors are partners and competitors, right? And, and it, you know, if you're not careful, it, it uh, you know, the, the, you can have a very bad taste in, in these kind of organizations. But, you know, so far we have been uh, doing it very, very, very good. Um, and a, a few of the, the uh, Linux distros already are contributors, and uh, we're working on getting Linux Foundation uh, into, uh, into the group as well. Um, so, we, you know, so we, we certainly welcome everybody to, to monitor and participate. And you know that's also m my reason to come over here. And you know, I also thank uh, Bidel because he was, he, he and I were colleagues at, at HP before he retired. Uh, so I, and I told him like, oh, you know, I, I I made this kind of presentations at Intel's Developers Forum, and I saw the Linux guys are there. And he said, no, you have to go to the Linux forum to make sure that the messages are communicated. It, it works the other way, not you know, not. You know, not you expect people to somehow go to the Intel forum, and so that's why I, I you know, I made the initial effort. This is my first time uh, in Australia, uh, <laughs> and uh, second time uh, presenting in front of the Linux folks. The other one was the Linux uh, Foundation Summit uh, back in uh, April. And uh, UEFI Secure Boot uh, is also an optional feature. You know, um, well, some OSs. Uh, you know, desired, you know, demanded it, but in, in terms of the spec, it's, a, it's a, 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 an optional feature. It doesn't, you know, it, you, you don't have to implement that on all classes of machines, but I think it's a good idea to implement them because of the reasons that I mentioned. If you don't have a way to uh, securely validate the next image that you're loading, then the vulnerability is actually higher than you know what you had in BIOS in some ways you know because in, in BIOS you still have this uh, you know uh, security through uh, obscurity right it's not good but it's harder for them to break 
but you know because of our standard effort, it, it became easy if you don't uh, secure the, the system up. And, uh, and then also there, there are some confusions about uh, you know, whether or not the system allows the vendor to, to put their own uh, control of the, the secure policy. And for general purpose machines like these, I think our, our position is that you know, these machines should uh, provide users the ability to move into the setup mode that I mentioned, and then allow the users to you know, configure the keys, uh, whatever uh, they, they, they want. Uh, but there are purpose-built machines, you know, ATM machines, for example, or the kiosk uh, in, the, in the airport, and those guys don't want you to mess around, right? So, you know, those machines are probably locked down deep. Um, and, yeah, so, so those are the, the type of things that, that you, you have to uh, kind of think through. And, and then the, uh, you know, for our platform vendors, uh, we also have some concerns, like uh, I think that there are some desires of keeping our, you know, for example, I mentioned the platform key, right? There are some desires that somehow, you know, the platform vendors keep the, keep the platform key and allow the user to somehow uh, modify these uh, key exchange keys and DB, DBX uh, keys. Well, we just, you know, for HP, we just don't quite feel comfortable about doing that because you know, it's our platform key, right? If you want to take over, wipe out all the keys and put your keys into it. Don't, you know, put our keys in, you know, uh, you know don't confuse people because the, the platform is not, no longer owned by us. It's owned by you. So you need to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that the right keys are in there. And the last thing that I had was, you know, there are security-related features out there. There are differences, and UEFI Secure Boot and TCG Measure Boot are two different things. They can be complementary, but they are different. So make sure when you look at all, uh, a lot of these press releases or, or uh, blogs or whatever out there, make sure you understand the differences. Otherwise, you know, the TPM really has some, some issues, right? You know, some countries may not like it or whatever. So we don't, we don't want to get into that. Okay, so I think that's what I have. Uh, I think it's, it's very recent information. You know, I, I tried to update uh, what, what, what I know so far. Um, so I guess questions or? Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for questions. I'm assuming Dong will be wait outside taking questions. Later. Sure, yeah, I, yeah, I can be available. So if you do and have questions, approach him, please. Um, we're unfortunately out of time. Um, we would like to thank you for the speech uh, on behalf of the thank conference you. organizers and Linux Australia. That's just an appreciation gift.